lovely introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me. So, um, welcome to the Cardio Oncology Clinic. Um, I'm going to tell you a little overview, and um, it's a very general overview about what my clinic does um, for cancer patients um, from a cardiology perspective. Um, it's just going to be, like I said, it's a very basic overview. It's not going to go into details, but hopefully you'll get some information out of my presentation tonight. So cardio-oncology is really a blending of two specialties. Um, cardiology, obviously, and oncology is the other uh, aspect of it. Uh, we collaborate with the oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center and uh, in the effort to try to provide the best care that we can on both sides uh, to our cancer patients. The cardio-oncology clinic uh, operates out of the South Health Campus. Unfortunately, that is the only place that you can come and see us, but we do um, a lot of business as far as imaging and whatnot around the city of Calgary, and we try to make it convenient for our patients. We have two full-time nurse clinicians, of which I am one, and we also have one point uh, four nurse clinician, and she joins us for two days a week in the clinic. Uh, we have an administrative support full-time booking clerk, and honestly, without her support and uh, her efforts, I could not do my job. So uh, LAMA is a very great resource for us. The clinic also has support from a pharmacist, uh, whether they're coming into the clinic for a visit or a virtual clinic. She comes and she shares her expertise in medications as far as asking the patients what they're on um, and checking the interactions between those medications and the Tom Baker Cancer Center medications, uh, making sure there's no interactions. And certainly if we start a new medication, making sure that there's no interactions. Um, she also provides medication teaching to our patients when they come to clinic or by phone. And she also provides support to the nursing staff if we have questions about new medications that are coming out on the market for cancer care. Um, and again, we could not do our jobs without that wonderful support from the pharmacist. Our physician support is limited, but we do have Dr. Lewis Coleman, who is the interim cardio-oncology lead. Um, and then several doctors which support our clinic um, at the at their discretion because they obviously have other duties to perform within Alberta Health Services. So we do not have um, regularly scheduled clinic days. We have days that are given to us by the physicians and we fill those clinics. So um, we appreciate their support and are glad uh, for the support they're able to give us at this uh, busy time in all of our lives. Um, so what is cardio-oncology? Well, <laughs> the primary focus with cardio-oncology is around chemotherapy and radiation-related cardiotoxicities. So then we need to uh, decide what is cardiotoxicity. Well, simply put, cardiotoxicity is a condition when there is damage to the heart muscle. And as a result of cardiotoxicity, your heart may not be able to pump blood throughout your body as well as it normally does. And this may be due to chemotherapy drugs or other medications you are taking to control your disease. Now we do um, currently uh, have the cardiac amyloidosis patient group as well. They're managed through our clinic, but this will become its very own clinic um, in the near future. Uh, Dr. Noel Fine runs that part of our clinic and we do deal with patients um, with uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Now, there are several different types of cardiac amyloidosis. One is a cancerous type and has its own heart uh, problems associated with the drugs and the disease process itself. So we deal with those types of patients. And we also deal with another type of patients um, through a, a misfolding gene called transthyretin. And there's two types of those patients. And one is called a wild type or age-related and the other is hereditary. Um, and I just really wanted to mention that, um, but we won't be uh, following that through because as I said, the clinic's going to become its own entity very soon. Um, so what does our service offer for patients? Um, Cardio-oncology offers monitoring for early cardiotoxicity. So 
the monitoring portion of our clinic is a very big portion of our clinic. We monitor any patient that's um, receiving anthracycline chemotherapy, such as doxorubicin or epirubicin, uh, very common in lymphomas and um, breast cancer, uh, and Herceptin, which is also very common in breast cancer and can be used for patients that are metastatic. Both of those drugs can cause um, decrease in heart function. Anthracycline-based uh, chemotherapies cause a longer uh, duration of possible uh, effects to the heart, whereas Herceptin only uh, causes effects while you're on the medication. So we provide monitoring for that. We also provide secondary prevention of cardiotoxicity. So um, if your LV function were to drop, we provide um, protection to keep the heart nice and strong during your treatment. Um, we also provide investigations of suspected cardiac invasion by tumor. And thankfully we don't get very many of those referrals, but when we do, we can use a couple of different modes to investigate whether the tumor is actually invading the cardiac space. And usually it's by cardiac MRI or echocardiogram. We also provide a preoperative assessment for cancer surgery. Uh, this would include high risk patients that are going to maybe possibly have tumor resection. Um, we offer opinions on whether the patient is actually uh, able to uh, get the surgery from a cardiac point of view. Um, we also manage other cardiovascular toxicities. There's a lot of cancer drugs that are out there that can cause different problems within the cardiovascular system. Hypertension is one example. Um, some of the drugs do cause high blood pressure. So we manage those cardiac toxicities within our clinic. Um, and then finally, uh, primary prevention of cardiotoxicity. So that would be a patient that they would send to us for cardiac clearance in a high-risk patient. High-risk patients are usually deemed uh, patients that have several other problems besides their cancer, like high blood pressure or diabetes or kidney function um, impairment. So those are the services that we offer through our cardio-oncology uh, clinic. Um, you might ask, why is there a need for uh, cardio-oncology clinics? Well, there's a, a huge need for them, actually. They're springing up pretty much all over the uh, North America and Europe. And the reason why is because cancer patients are much more likely to survive their disease as treatments have improved over time. Um, patients are living longer past their cancer diagnosis and um, that's why there's needs for cardio-oncology clinics to manage those patients that have um, impairments from their chemotherapy. Uh, the toxicity of conventional cancer treatments is greater than previously appreciated. So years ago, they didn't know that these uh, treatments were causing the toxicity. Now they do. So um, we're there to catch the treatment uh, side effects early. And then new targeted therapies are being developed at a rapid pace. I can't tell you how many new drugs I see every day when I uh, go into clinic. Um, many of these new drugs have recognized uh, through the clinical trials or unrecognized cardiovascular toxicity. So there's a, a great need for cardio-oncology clinics to catch these toxicities and treat the patients accordingly. Um, there's different things that qualify as cardiovascular toxicities, and there's many, but I just I put down some of the main ones that we see in our clinic. And of course, hypertension is one of them. Uh, myocardial ischemia and, and arterial thrombosis or clots is another one. Several drugs um, cause both of those. Arrhythmias are caused by certain cancer um, therapies. Um, can range from um, atrial fibrillation is one that comes to mind. It's a very common one uh, associated with one of the drugs treated um, or used for lymphoma, and that's ibrutinib. Um, we see that quite often. QT prolongation, well, most cancer patients are getting anti-nausea medications, and most anti-nausea medications in, in, in itself can cause uh, QT prolongation, and that particular disorder can cause lethal arrhythmias if untreated, so we see that as well. Um, ventricular dysfunction, heart failure from the anthracycline herceptin group, 
and other groups we're discovering as we as we go down this journey of cardio oncology. And then myocarditis is is new to me in the last couple of years with the new treatments for small cell carcinoma. Um, especially, uh, sorry about that, uh, pembrolizumab is one that can cause it. Um, so we see all of those toxicities. And like I said, there's, there's many more that go along, but too many to list. Uh, Cardio-oncology, um, our role uh, in it is, is we're a nurse-led clinic. So the nursing staff pretty much does all the legwork prior to the patients coming in to see the physicians, um, if that's the pathway that they're on. Uh, we tri triage all the referrals. We make the decisions as to what test gets uh, ordered, um, and it's pretty straightforward with the um, surveillance arm of our clinic, but what test gets ordered, how soon it gets ordered, when the patient gets seen at clinic, who's the, you know, who's the sickest, who gets to go to the first of the line and, and come in the quickest. Um, we make those decisions. We are also the li liaison between the physicians and the patients. Um, patients call us with issues or symptoms and we discuss it with them over the phone, uh, sometimes in clinic. And then we discuss it with the physician for further direction as to the care of the patient. Um, we also provide patient education um, as far as uh, cardiovascular issues are concerned, what they can expect, what they need to look for. And we also provide support to the patient and family, uh, either in person or by phone, uh, answering questions in regard to their cardiac status or issues. Lately, it's been a lot more phone than in person, of course, due to the COVID situation, but um, we're, we, we do provide good support to the families and patients. Um, some of the common testing, cardiac testing that we use within our clinic to uh, support patients um, would be the cardiac MRI. Um, this uses magnetics to produce images. The images are quite sharp and they give us good um, data to tell us, you know, what's going on with the patient's heart. Is it normal? Is it abnormal? Is it pumping properly? Um, echocardiograms uh, give us the same information. That the pictures are not as sharp as the cardiac MRI, but it uses ultrasound waves to uh, produce those images. Um, you know, they use the fancy wand with the gel and they push on you and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, but the waves bounce off the, of the heart and then give us pictures as to, again, how well the heart pumps and how well the walls move and how well the valves open and close. Um, so good technology there to tell us what we need to know as far as heart function and, and how well the heart pumps. Holters are used um, for patients uh, commonly because we get a lot of patients that have racing heartbeats or as they describe it, palpitation. So holter monitors use simple ECG technology, only it's a 24 hour picture of your heart um, conduction. And we can tell if you have any um, irregular rhythms such as atrial fibrillation or extra beats, which a lot of people have. Um, and we use those, that tool quite a bit. Uh, blood pressure monitors as well, because some of the medications that uh, cancer patients receive can cause high blood pressure. We use the blood pressure monitors to either uh, diagnose it or rule it out. Um, and if so, and if they do have high blood pressure, then we treat it accordingly. Um, and then there's usually standard blood work that goes along um, with our clinic. Two of the most uh, standard blood tests that we do are biomarkers, which is what we call them, but they're lab tests that can tell us when the heart gets into trouble early. Um, both One is a marker for heart damage, which is commonly used for patients that have heart attacks, and the other marker is used for patients that have heart failure. So we trend them along with our imaging to see if, if they're going up and then a decrease in function sends up the red flag for us to to possibly do a consult and get patients started on treatment so that their heart function remains nice and strong. Um, so what can you can expect from us if you do um, have a, a referral to our clinic from the oncology team is the initial phone call from one of the nurses to explain our clinic. And we go into great depth 
as far as explanations are concerned about what we do, how we do it, when we do it, and why we do it. Um, and then how we're going to be involved in your care uh, overall and for how long we're going to be involved in your care. Um, and then we talk a little bit about why it's so important to monitor your heart through your cancer treatment. I can't stress enough to my patients on how important that is because unfortunately with, with cancer treatments, we don't know which patients are going to be affected by their treatment. There's no data to tell us Sally's going to be picked over Jane or Joe's going to have problems over John, right? So we do a lot of monitoring and through that monitoring, we do catch the small percentage of patients that have trouble with, with their cancer treatments and we get them into cardiac treatment early so that once the Tom Baker, you know, hopefully cures your cancer, then you've got a nice strong heart um, to go on with the rest of your life after your therapy is done. That's why it's so important. Um, we talk about the protocols for imaging, which we just recently revamped, and which imaging we'll be ordering for your particular type of cancer. Um, signs and symptoms, we talk about those too, because we want you to be aware of what, um, what could happen if your heart is getting into trouble, because we have our protocols for imaging, but you're an important link to let us know if you're having trouble. Two of the biggest um, symptoms that I tell my patients about are shortness of breath and swelling to the lower legs and ankles. Because if you think of the heart as a pump, if you can't pump the fluid out, what's gonna happen? It's gonna back up and it backs up into your lungs and it backs up into your lower legs and ankles. And that's why I tell them mostly to keep an eye out for that. There's other signs and symptoms. Um, you know, there's uh, some patients have chest pain, some patients have um, fatigue, fatigue usually goes with chemo. So that's a tough one. But we really want you to call us when you have those symptoms, because again, um, early detection of cardiotoxicity is so important to get you started on treatment if you're one of the few people that do have problems with your cancer therapy. Um, and then depending on what you tell us on the phone will depend on what our next action is as far as treatment, coming to see us in clinic, maybe you need more imaging, maybe you need some blood work. So um, that's what I, we tell patients on the phone. And then we give you our phone number so that you can call us if you have questions or concerns or comments about your care. Um, very, very supportive clinic um, there at the South Campus. Um, and then finally, if you're gonna take away anything from what I've chatted about this evening, please take away that we do provide close monitoring of patients before and after treatment. Um, we uh, changed our protocol so that we, we follow you up to three years now, but we don't leave you in a lurch after that. We teach you what to look for and who to go to if you should get symptoms past our time and, and your journey with our clinic. Um, we also, I want you to take away that um, we do provide prompt treatment of cardiotoxicities arising from chemotherapy treatments. Uh, most of our patients never go past 30 days without, if they need to be seen, being seen, depending on what their symptoms are. Um, and then um, that we wanted uh, you to take away that there are good medical therapies that are tried and true for patients who do require treatment for their chemotherapy toxicities. These treatments have been given to patients over years and years and years, and they're tolerated very well because it's scary to think that something's going on with your heart and you need treatment, but they, they truly are good medical therapies. And then um, lastly, just to, to know that the nursing uh, staff in, in the cardio-oncology clinic provides good support and education for patients and families in regards to the imaging, medications, side effects of the medications. I mean, pretty much any question you may have, uh, the nurses are able to answer. So I hope that you've enjoyed my brief overview of what the cardio-oncology clinic does. Uh, I want to thank the Libin uh, Cardiovascular Institute for inviting me to participate this evening. And I do appreciate uh, the time that you've all taken out of your busy schedules um, to come and listen to my presentation. And at that, I will turn it back over to Camelia. 
Thank you, Deb, for this outstanding uh, presentation and uh, just hearing uh, you talk and, uh, and seeing the care that you, 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 you put into caring for these patients is really uh, heartwarming. Uh, so we have a few questions uh, and uh, we'll take a couple and before we move on. Uh, so the first question, uh, so David asks, uh, how does having an ICD, um, so how does having an ICD that, that does not permit MRI affect diagnosis of the cancer? Uh, what other options uh, are available? If I'm under, I, I understood the question to be how does an ICD, pre, I'm sorry, prevent a diagnosis of cancer or? So if you have an ICD and you are not able to have an MRI, how does that affect your uh, diagnosis of cancer? As Maybe far as I know, as far as I know, um, having an ICD um, with an MRI, there are ICD compatible uh, devices for MRI. I don't know the oncology diagnosis part of it uh, or whether the ICD would be compatible, but there's um, other routes to diagnose cancer um, besides an MRI. Most of the tests that I see that come out of the uh, Tom Baker are CAT scans, which are no problem for ICDs, and PET scans, which are uh, no problems for ICDs. So those are the two modalities that I see that come out most often. Um, as far as cardiology, if a patient has an ICD and can't be diagnosed for heart function because it's not compatible, then we go straight to echocardiogram because those are, it doesn't matter with an echo and it gives us the same information as the MRI does. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> so David, please, um, if, if you would like to provide additional clarification, uh, you can come off mute and then uh, ask the questions and, and that will, uh, will make her best to answer that. And we can answer that question later at the second, uh, of the second answer, a question and answer period. The second question is about Valcade, uh, if it does cause heart problems. I'm sorry, if what, if what causes heart problems? Valcade, oh, Val, yeah, Valcade. Oh, Val, Valcade. Um, there's uh, probably a little bit of data to say that it can, but from my experience with the Valcade, um, that's not the biggest culprit to cause heart problems. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not an expert on oncology medications, but um, uh, Velcade, as far as I know, is not a big culprit of causing heart dysfunction. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deb, for this presentation, uh, for this answer. So Deb is going to remain with us um, for the remainder of tonight, and we'll shift our gears to our next presenter here. So, uh, so tonight we have the pleasure of having Dr. Lin Yang. She's an epidemiologist in the Department of Cancer uh, Epidemiology and Pre Pre Prevention Research. Her research primarily focuses on the role of energy balance in cancer prevention and uh, survivorship. She obtained her training in kinesiology, statistics, and physical, act physical activity promotion, nutritional epidemiology, circadian and sleep epidemiology, and she's a transdisciplinary researcher in, in, in cancer. Uh, Dr. Yang has conducted several observational studies and intervention studies as well, examining the impact of obesity, physical activity, and sedentary behavior on cancer. Uh, her passion are in uh, uh, mostly in using transdiscipl transdisciplinary approaches, uh, and uh, she integrates different methodologies such as clinical uh, research, epidemiology, implementation science, uh, to elucidate the biological mechanism of energy balance and cancer to inform personalized intervention, uh, paving the way to a sustainable scaling up. 
So on that note, welcome Dr. Yang and uh, please feel free to uh, share your screen. If you're talking, Dr. Young, we can hear you. And um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Camilla. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm really happy to be here present some work or more like introduction on cardio oncology. Uh, together with Deb and uh, really appreciate the presentation by Deb just now and for me it was also I learned a lot from from this and because um, my uh, primary work is cancer prevention and survivorship and cardio oncology is um, is a rather new I would say it's a rather new uh, field in the in the cancer survivorship especially for us who uh, focus on lifestyle behavior um, so I would like to today just introduce a bit uh, background of cardio oncology as well as how exercise has a role um, in improving uh, outcomes um, for cancer patients who may experience elevated cardiovascular risk, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, so, um, so from uh, from the earlier uh, talk by Deb, we've learned what is cardio oncology. And uh, this was mainly from the cardiotoxicity from uh, cancer treatment, which we were not aware of um, decades ago. And if we look at more population-based data, and so I, I was not able to find data for Canada. So I'm presenting you the data here from population-based study in the States, um, where they look at the causes of uh, death or mortality among cancer uh, among cancer survivors, and um, from they 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 look at the the cause of death from two thousand seven uh, sorry not two thousand nineteen seventy um, up to two thousand ten or later, and uh, because there are different types of cancers, right? And so those are um, the types of cancers where. Uh, the cause due to cancer are rather stable, but a similar, similar stable trend would see um, the cause of death due to cardiovascular uh, disease um, among cancer survivors. And we see a, uh, the primary cause of uh, mortality in, in these types of cancer are cancer instead of cardiovascular disease. Um, but they are also um, other um, other types of cancer where we see that over last uh, 40 or 50 years in these types of cancers we see a dramatic improvement in mortality due to cancer uh, in, in this you know including colorectal cancer and non hodgkin uh, um, lymphoma and kidney cancer and um, we see that the cause of death due to cardiovascular uh, disease in these types of cancer are, are also rather stable, uh, maybe a little bit the elevation over the past 40 to 50 years, but uh, uh, cancer would remain um, the, uh, the main cause of, of death for these types of cancers. But there are also other types of cancers, especially we can see that breast cancer, which is the most um, common cancer in women. And uh, also we see prostate cancer here, which is the most common cancer in men, um, and including bladder cancer or endometrial cancer. We see that even though there is a dramatic improvement in mortality due to cancer in these uh, cancer survivors, uh, there seems to be an elevation on um, the cause of death due to cardiovascular disease. And in some cancers, if we see prostate and bladder and endometrial cancer, you see that the patients are 
the cancer survivors, um, more cancer survivors are dying from cardiovascular disease instead of cancer. So uh, um, that's that's when that, that's when we start to ask the question why this is happening. Um, so first of all, cancer and the cardiovascular disease actually have uh, a lot of shared etiology and uh, age being the most the strongest uh, predictors. And there is also a sex difference and a range of lifestyle factors are, um, are both uh, are drivers uh, for both cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease, including tobacco obesity and unhealthy diets and physical inactivity. Um, and the cancer therapy adds more uh, into this um, shared uh, etiology between cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease. For cancer patients, uh, I think there's some comorbidity due to cardiovascular disease may limit them um, from accessing certain cancer drugs. And also when Deb was mentioning the uh, pre-surgery assessment and some of the cardiovascular disease related risk factor or the disease itself, it's the comorbidity level is too high. That probably will stop the cancer patients from getting surgery, which may be a curative uh, treatment for them. Um, but that was happening during like a, a, a way we would consider it like a acute effect, you know, what's happening when you are um, uh, receiving the cancer treatment or cancer therapy. But there is also a chronic effect and uh, the, the, um, the, the heart damage, the cardio uh, toxicity may have a long lasting effect uh, among the cancer survivors, even after you survive cancer. And uh, uh, some of the shared etiology may be even worsened uh, after the cancer treatment, which may um, impair the quality of life of cancer survivors during their long uh, survivorship. And, um, and uh, the, the history of cancer in turn, uh, later on, that may limit uh, some patients from accessing to certain uh, cardiovascular disease uh, cardiovascular disease uh, treatment or, or drugs uh, as well. So it's, it's quite a um, bi-direction, bi-directional bi uh, relationship here. Um, so there are some research study have shown that certain types of um, treatment may increase uh, the uh, long-term uh, long cardiovascular disease uh, in cancer survivors. So here I'm showing you that how this uh, an, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, which is a hormonal therapy for prostate cancer, and uh, this type of therapy may increase uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease in, in men treated prostate cancer uh, over eight years. So that that is telling us the um, the elevated uh, risk of of cardiovascular disease among cancer survivors can be really long lasting. Um, there are also some data showing that, uh, for for example, here uh, is is a figure showing that how uh, the risk of major uh, coronary uh, events among breast cancer survivors can be can increase with the mean dose of radiation to hearts when they were receiving, of course, that was when, when they were receiving uh, the cancer treatments. Um, um, and also uh, from an international perspective, this is a rather very new study just published in 2019. So they look at uh, more like international data. Uh, what is the, what are uh, those types of um, CVD uh, incidents among cancer survivors by different types of cancer and uh, how that is different from expected uh, CVD incidents. So meaning that if you do not have cancer, what kind of uh, CVD risk you would be uh, expecting. So we see that in, in those types of cancer, lung cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin uh, non lymphoma, colorectal cancer, um, um, uh, uterine cancer, we can see that 
uh, not only what we saw previously in prostate cancer and breast cancer, in those types of cancers, new data is also emerging that the cardiovascular disease risk uh, increase um, among cancer survivors um, over time. And what's interesting uh, for the colorectal cancer and lung cancer and uterine, uh, uh, uterine cancer is that it seems like the elevated CVD risk uh, was highest among the first five years. And after, the, after five years, it kind of like uh, goes, goes down and similar to uh, the population expected incidence for, um, you know, cancer-free population. Um, so I wouldn't go into details on the cardiovascular toxicity associated with anti-cancer drugs, but in general, it has, uh, it has damage to the heart itself um, as an organ, as well as uh, it may increase certain um, um, cardiovascular conditions such as hypertension. And they also uh, have a damage on the, uh, the vascular system uh, beyond the heart muscle itself. Um, so this was uh, back in 2011 and uh, the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology um, announced this position statement and to quote them and say that the cured cancer patients of today does not want to be the heart failure patients of tomorrow. Um, that was, um, that was uh, I, I, I would not say cardio oncologist was recognized back then. Uh, that was 10 years ago, but that was when the attention and the research has been really start to grow. And uh, that's when the cardiologist and, uh, and, and the cancer um, can oncologist start to work together to address this really important issues uh, for, for cancer patients. And I'm um, just listing a few position papers and the recommendations from different types of organizations. Uh, internationally and to, to emphasize on the importance to, to recognize cardio-oncology. And from a research, per, um, research uh, perspective, there's also this new journal dedicated to cardio-oncology established in 2015. So all this together, we, we, we see that it's a, it's a rather young field in terms of research, although uh, I'm sure it has been recognized in, in, in clinical practice for, would be long, um, you know, longer than, than, than five, six years. And in Canada, um, so the Canadian Cardiac, uh, cardiac Oncology Network was, especially, uh, it was established in 2011. And uh, so that was focusing on to understanding how cancer therapies impact cardiac health. So that's probably also the same time where we, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cardio oncologist clinic was established in Alberta. Uh, but from a lifestyle pers perspective, I always think, is this just cardiac, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac health? And it's actually more than that. It's not only the cardiac, uh, cardiac uh, health. If we look at the data, the, the, the fracture uh, risk uh, in, in men, uh, prostate cancer, men treated with hormone therapy also increased over time, uh, you know, uh, in, in the long term as well. If you see the, the from those, those figures, so those figures basically was telling us that the risk of fracture in prostate cancer, men who were treated by hormone therapy were higher uh, than those men um, without prostate cancer, nor those treatment over six years. And uh, similar data was reported for breast cancer um, treatment that some of the breast cancer treatment are associated with higher risk of fracture as well. And uh, there are also some data to show that the physical function uh, in men with prostate cancer was also uh, impaired compared to people, compared to the men without prostate cancer or not have the treatment. Um, so it, it's more like uh, uh, there is a specific 
uh, there's more, um, there is a cardiotoxicity that is uh, specific to the cancer treatment, but the cancer survivors also may be experiencing uh, acceler accelerated aging overall uh, when they go through cancer and the cancer treatment as well. But this is all hypothesized because we do not currently have enough data to support uh, this hypothesis. But um, from what the data from the data we have observed, we see this you know elevated CVD risk in the long term and the fracture and the physical function. So it's more like a, a, a system, a, a systematic level of aging uh, with some uh, with some maybe some uh, particular organ to to be um, that, that was damaged more through the treatment including the heart and uh, when we think about when we think about the the, the aging as a system uh, we all uh, of course everyone has a biological age uh, sorry everyone has a chronologic age um, but we, from just from our life, we see that people with the same age, they can have very different outlook or functions. So those outlook and the functions are probably more close to the biological age. And um, from the research that we've conducted, we saw that the lifestyle is a really strong um, uh, factor to, to um uh, to benefit your biological age, even with the growing chronological age. And in terms of physical activity or exercise itself, uh, so exercise has been considered as a medicine oncology. And this paper, with this study, um, I think this, uh, this is a guideline really. The guideline was uh, established by the American College of sports medicine, they, uh, they organize an uh, expert panel back in 2018, and uh, they um, summarized the evidence on exercise to prevent cancer and uh, benefit during the cancer survivorship. And also they put out this position paper and to, to urge the clinicians to help patients to become active. Um, I, I want to talk a bit more on um, what is the level of evidence, so how exercise can benefit uh, cancer survivors. And we see very strong evidence on exercise to reduce anxiety and to manage depression, and the fatigue and the quality of life. Um, and where you can see that the cardiotoxicity is also listed here. Uh, except for the evidence level for exercise to um, um, reduce uh, cardiotoxicity is, is considered as in, in, insufficient. But one of the reasons why it is insufficient, insufficient uh, evidence is also that uh, it's, it's, it's a newly recognized um, issue and uh, there has been some small or experimental animal study have shown that it is promising that exercise may improve the cardiotoxicity. We just don't have good, um, we just don't have a, a good study to show, like to, to conclude uh, this evidence yet. Um, but from a long-term uh, risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, point out view from the epidemiological study, uh, the data we have shown that uh, in women with non-metastatic breast cancers in their long-term survival, um, the higher level of physical activity is, uh, is, is, is associated with significantly lower uh, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular uh, events uh, over, over nearly uh, Seven, uh, nine years. So that means that uh, physical activity or exercise can really protect your cardiovascular health even after cancer. Um, so for me, the next question will be like, so what types of exercise? There's so many different types of exercise. There can be strength training, aerobics, uh, strength training more focusing on muscle strength and aerobic training more focusing on cardiovascular, um, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness and the balance 
then that focusing on balance ability to keep balance, then also they're stretching. So which one? Um, if we look at the epidemiological evidence, actually we've seen that the, the, the muscle strength uh, is associated with decreased cancer mortality risk. And also the muscle, uh, muscle mass uh, is associated with decreased um, cardiovascular disease risk. So that means that if you're a cancer survivor, if you survive the cancer, and uh, the amount of muscle may be protective from you uh, to get uh, from from you getting cardiovascular disease later on, but although I have to say that such data, you know, the data we have right now are from non-cancer patients. We are making these assumptions, although uh, although they are very biologically plausible, uh, we just don't have enough data to show that at the moment. Um, the 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 the. Uh, the other aspect of fitness, the cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, is has a strong association, um, protective uh, effects on um, all types of disease risk and all types of uh, mortality uh, from different types of uh, disease. And actually, uh, the cardiorespiratory fitness is one of the uh, most studied and the most well understood domain of fitness um, in our human health. Um, so this is uh, this is to show that the the, the higher cardiorespiratory fitness uh, was associated with decreased cardiovascular disease risk in both men and women, and very consistent association, even if for people who have other um, cardiovascular disease risk factors we can still see a strong protective effect from a cardiorespiratory fitness. And uh, our new research have shown that the balance um, ability is also a, a, a predictive of, of mortality of all cause uh, from cancer and from cardiovascular disease. So that means that a good balance ability is also very important for our health. And um, there are less study, um, research have done focusing on uh, flexibility or stretching, but uh, there's some very interesting study have shown that the trunk um, flexibility is associated with artery uh, stiffen uh, stiffening. And the artery stiffness is a, is a very strong, um, I think it's a very clinically meaningful measure for cardiovascular disease uh, risk. And so this, this also shows some evidence that the stretching can be good for your heart health. Uh, but of course, to, to be able to, to really uh, have a conclusion on that, we, we basically need more research studies. And so to come back to what types of exercise, and uh, I'm very biased on this, and I, 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 have, um, I do Tai Chi myself, and I think uh, Tai Chi is a mind-body exercise that uh, not only it combines uh, the move of your mind and the body, as well that the uh, Tai Chi actually um, combined strength, aerobic balance, and strength, uh, uh, stretching training all together. And another advantage of Tai Chi, I think, is that um, you don't need any equipment and uh, it's rather uh, low cost. And uh, if you are experiencing some physical deconditioning, um, it's easier to do Tai Chi compared to other types of high intensity activity. And we've done this study to look at, so what is the health benefit of Tai Chi? Um, among people who have existing chronic il illnesses we were actually able to identify uh, studies across 14 different types of chronic diseases. And we, there has been studies shown benefits of Tai Chi in managing either general or disease specific health outcome in these conditions. And uh, specific to, to cancer, um, the number of studies of Tai Chi, I have to say that uh, is, is not uh, too many is limited, and most of the study um, uh, was was done in 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 uh, breast cancer, and there's less known in other types of cancers. Um, but uh, 
and, and none of those uh, none of those target study in cancer have looked at specifically uh, a cardiotoxicity um, measures or any measure that is related to um, cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, however, there are study of uh, Taiji exercise or Taiji training um, done among uh, patients who had a heart failure. And interesting enough is that in these types of patient population, uh, we've seen improvement in clinical importance indicators among heart failure patients. So it's very likely that uh, these, ty these types of low impact, uh, easy movement exercise may bring uh, the cardiovascular benefits in cancer survivors as well. And so just to uh, conclude, I, I, uh, from what we've done in terms of research, we see that exercise is a promising strategy to manage cardiovascular risk after cancer. And these ex exercises include aerobics training and strength training, balance training, some evidence from stretching and, 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 uh, and, and exercise uh, types such as Tai Chi, which can blend um, different uh, components of the fitness together, maybe, maybe um, uh, bring us more benefits. Uh, to, to manage the cardiovascular disease um, as well. Uh, but the, the question we, we don't uh, but we, we don't know at this moment is that how do we identify cancer survivors who will benefit the most from exercise to reduce um, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular risk? Because some of the damage from the cancer treatment probably could not be reversed, but some of the elevated cardiovascular disease risk may be reversed, but at this moment, we just don't know who, who will achieve uh, the most benefit. Um, finally, I want to stress again that uh, chrono, uh, chronology age and the functional age are two different things. And, uh, and, and in general, I feel like if we keep a healthy lifestyle and be active, uh, we can have good function uh, no matter your chronological, uh, no matter how old your chronological age and uh, um, all the chronic disease uh, conditions that we have survived. And I want to uh, acknowledge all my uh, collaborators um, from different countries, as well as uh, um, my uh, funding agency that have supported my work. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just uh, going to give this back to Camellia. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Lynn, uh, for this awesome presentation. And uh, uh, we are right on the dot at that time. So I just want to open it for a few questions. Uh, if people have a couple of questions uh, they want to ask either uh, to Lynn or to Deb, we can ask a couple of questions and uh, before we, we end tonight. So feel free to type in the chat or... Um,